Good morning, good morning. Happy New Year. We are uh, so excited for what God has done in 2017, and we're even more excited about what God is going to be doing in 2018. It has been an awesome year. We are 21 weeks into uh, this thing we call Prodigal Church, and uh, we're just so stoked at what God's doing, and we have just look forward to in just a bright 2018. There were three frogs on a log. One of them decides to jump. How many are left? Three. Uh, he just decided. He didn't actually take the leap. This morning, we're going to look at the journey of Abraham and discover some of the things in his life, right and wrong, that could help us move forward in 2018 to live the kind of blessed life that God calls us towards. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis, very first book of the Bible, Gen Genesis chapter 11 and 12. We're going to be kind of camping out and kind of taking a bird's eye view through the life of Abraham and looking at his journey and seeing how that intersects with our journey uh, today, December 31st, 2017. The journey begins in ancient Mesopotamia, the land of Ur, around 2000 BC. Here's a picture of ancient Mesopotamia. The, in this land, people worshipped all different kinds of gods, and in Ur was this guy named Abram. Abram was well-liked in Ur. His family was there. His friends were all there. They never had to go any other place because everything was there in the city. It was one of the most developed uh, cities in the ancient world. And actually, the ziggurat in the center of Ur still exists today, 2,000 years later. Then something monumental happens to Abram. This God that Abram had never heard of has this conversation with him. Now, we have some of the details of this conversation found in Genesis chapter 12, but Something so significant happened in that conversation. So significant that the three largest world religions on the planet all trace their origins to this conversation with Abram. Judaism, Islam, Christianity, all trace their beginnings to this one conversation in the land of Ur 2,000 years ago. What was so special about it? Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it'll be on the screens. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all of the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here's this pagan worshiping guy and he has this amazing supernatural encounter with the divine and calls him to be a blessing to all nations. It's just unbelievable that God would speak to this small person. But the same call that God placed on Abram's life 2,000 years ago is the same call that he places on our lives as well. Um, God has called every one of us to be a blessing to everyone. Be a blessing not only to the nations, but to our families, to our communities, to our coworkers, and even to our enemies. If you want 2008 to be the year of blessing, then it starts with you being a blessing to others. And that's point number one in your notes. Be a blessing to others. We love the part of the Abrahamic covenant that I will bless you. When God says that, we're like, yes, amen. I'm writing that down. God's gonna bless me. That means finances. That means kids. That means, um, you know, st stunning good looks, etc. The second part, though, is just as important. I will bless you to be a blessing. And whenever the nation of Israel is thriving, it's when they're also being a blessing. But when they just get focused on that one thing, oh, God's going to bless us, that, and they lose track of blessing others, they get taken on a different route. And so do we. Um, unselfishness is, should be one of the main characteristics of a follower of Jesus. And actually, if you're interested more in hearing about, more, about unselfishness, you could download our Death to Selfie series that we did in September and October. But many of us in this room, when we hear the word Christian, unselfishness is not the first term that comes to our mind, right? Often, sometimes it's judgmental or hypocritical. But picture everyone in this room, picture that just your life is represented by a $1,000 bill. I don't think they exist. 
Um, I've never seen one. I've never obtained one. But picture your life is in a $1,000 bill. And we think that the way we give our life to God is just that one prayer, that one day when we were 16 or when we were 12, and we laid the $1,000 before God. We gave him our life. I don't think that's the way it works. If we as believers want to give our lives to God, I don't think it's a one-time thing. I think God invites us to go to the bank and to exchange that $1,000 for quarters. And so you've just got wheelbarrows full of quarters. And so you give to a needy child and you pay for a scholarship for their camp and you deposit a quarter. You love your spouse sacrificially and there's another quarter. You spend time with that employee that's really hard to love, another 25 cents. And so you give God 25 cents here and 50 cents there and you serve your spouse and your kids. You sacrifice your daily desires to be a blessing to others. Giving your life to Jesus isn't a one-time thing that you did on church one Sunday. It's an everyday thing that we do when we serve one another in love. That's giving our life to God. So God makes this covenant with Abram. And it's actually, uh, the theological term is called the Abrahamic covenant. It's one of the most important passages of scripture, but we're going to breeze right past it and look at uh, Abraham's response. Go back a chapter. It says this in 1131. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. They settled there. The land of promise was in Canaan, but they get to Haran and they settle there. Point number two on your notes is this. If you want to be a blessing in, in the year 2018, don't settle there. For many of us in this room, God's called us to some amazing places, but somewhere along the lines, we've settled there, right? He's called us, we know it, and we begin the journey but somewhere along the way, we've settled there. I once heard it said this, that you can't steer a parked car. I suppose you can steer it, but you're just not going anywhere, right? Picture this car, and you're like, God, move me. God, I, I'm, take me to where you want me to go. Take me to the promised land. I want to go to the land of Canaan, the land you're calling me to. You said go, I'm going to go. But the keys aren't even in the ignition. And God can steer it, but we've got to be moving. We've got to be moving. Some of you have pulled over and, and you're parked, and you're wondering why life is passing you by. Journey requires movement. We have to move for God to steer us and take us where he wants us to go. That's why Jesus says, follow me. He never says, stay right there. It's always a movement. It's always moving forward. And so God uh, calls Abram, they begin to go to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, and then they settle in Haran. Why did they do that? Well, because something happened in the land of Canaan, a famine. Uh, and then uh, Abram leaves the place he's supposed to, flees to the land of Egypt, which was the superpower at the time. And he was supposed to be in Canaan, but the circumstances in Canaan weren't that great because of the famine. And so then he goes to another place in Egypt. When the going got tough, he left. You ever been there? Things are going great. You're following God. Everything's awesome. But then bad stuff just starts to happen. You get laid off. You get divorced. Someone close to you passes away. And it's almost as if the closer you got to God, the worse things became in your life. If you find yourself further away from God than you used to be. Who moved? God always draws near. It's us who often take steps away. I was talking with a friend not too long ago who was going through some tough times, and I asked him, man, how you doing? And he says, not too bad under the circumstances. Under the circumstances. And I said, why are you under the circumstances? Uh, don't, don't submit. Face them head on. Don't submit to the pressure that they put on you. Allow God to shoulder the burden. Don't be under the circumstances. Give them to God. 
Peter says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. That's an awesome promise. Cast your cares on me, on God, because he cares for you. Don't let circumstances determine your journey. Let God. If you want to be a blessing in the year, you want 2018 to be the year of blessing. Don't settle there. Don't settle there. Back to Abram's journey. Check out chapter 12. It says this. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And he was about to enter Egypt. He said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. So say you're my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake and Abram acquired sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, uh, men servants and maid servants and camels. Did Abram just let somebody else have sex with his wife? Because that's what the Bible says here. What? This is Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Uh, I am one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. This is the father of our faith. And dude just messed up big time, right? You don't do that. Oh, she's my sister. <laughs> there you go. That's messed up. This guy is no better than me, and he's no better than you. If I were God, I'd say, that's it, Abe. I gave you a fair shot. You blew it there in Egypt, so you're done. Somebody else I'll make into a father of many nations. Abraham was an extremely flawed human. So are you. So am I. We have big sins. We don't just have job interview sins. And you know what I mean when I say job interview sins, right? You know, when you go into a job interview and they ask you, tell me what your greatest weakness is. And then you say something dumb like, well, I care too much about people. Or I work too hard. Or sometimes I'm too much of a team player. <laughs> job interview sins. And I think the church would do the same thing, right? You're in a small group and maybe you're going around kind of sharing some of your struggles, some of your prayer requests. And you say, well, for me, I've been trying to read through the Bible in a year, and uh, I've skipped a few days. Can you guys pray for me? If that's your struggle, you are Jesus, okay? <laughs> One of the things we have done in the church is we have made a list of acceptable sins, sins that aren't so bad so that we aren't unwilling to share with people in God, but bad enough that we actually think we're confessing, but we're not. In this church, I know many of you. And I just want to say the problems that are facing us, they're not job interview sins. We've got some real problems. We've got some real addictions. We've got some real struggles. And we can't just leave it alone. Jesus calls us to do something about it. In every church, there are people. With every person, there are problems. It's okay. You're not the only sinner here. And it's important that we call sin, sin. Most of us would rather use the word mistake instead of sin and when we mess up. If everything I do wrong can be dumbed down to where it's just a mistake, then I'm a mistaker. I'm not a sinner. And if I'm not a sinner, then I don't have any need for a savior. If you're just a mistaker, all you gotta do is try harder. Right? If you just make mistakes, just try harder and you'll get there. But until you embrace the fact that you're a sinner, you're not open to embracing the fact that you need a savior. And we need a savior. I'm not a mistaker. I'm a sinner. And it, and it starts with that confession. And that's where revival can start. It can start in me and it can start in you. And part of it is saying, God, I'm a sinner. I need you. So what happens next in the story? Abram, Lot, and their families, they get pretty wealthy in Egypt. It's strange how God still blesses Abram even in the middle of disobedience right? Abram is supposed to be in Canaan. He goes to Egypt. He's supposed to be married to his wife, Sarai. And he says, that's my sister. And God is still blessing them in increasing their wealth. So they're headed back to Canaan. They've got lots of sheep, cattle, men servants, maid servants, all kinds of stuff. And so Lot's servants and Abram's servants start arguing on who's got what. 
that's my sheep, that's, uh, that's your sheep. Okay, and they start arguing about all their possessions. And so to avoid conflict, Abram uh, doesn't want this very tense situation. He allows Lot to choose which way he's going to go. Lot, if you go this way, I'll go that way. Lot, if you go that way, I'll go this way. So he, again, here, Abram is being unselfish. And in Genesis 13, this is what it says. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So Lot chose to pitch his tents near Sodom. Sodom was known for immorality, murder, crazy sex stuff, injustice, wickedness, not welcoming of strangers. When we think of Sodom, we think of, oh, that's that horrible, bad sex place. But actually, Ezekiel tells us what Sodom was condemned for, and it was because of injustice to the poor, not because of any crazy other sin. Sodom, this is what Sodom was known for. But, Sodom was the better agricultural choice. And Lot, being as shallow as he was, that's what he chose. He couldn't help to choose what was better materially, regardless of the company he'd have to keep. So if you were to approach Lot and go, hey, Lot, Sodom's a bad place, dude. You probably shouldn't be there. Lot would then say, well, that's why I'm not there. I'm near Sodom. I'm not in Sodom. There's always an excuse, right? There's always a justification, even with our own struggles. And not only that, we often point the finger at other people rather than pointing to ourselves. What's the phrase? Every time you point your finger at someone else, you've got four pointing back at yourself, which doesn't make any sense, right? Like picture yourself pointing at someone and you've only got three here that are pointing back at yourself. Unless you've got that weird thumb that it, it doesn't work. Phrase doesn't make sense. I remember in high school, I got up leave, uh, to leave early one morning for a meeting, and it was still dark outside, and I always parked in the same spot. I always parked my truck on the left side of the house, all the way up on the driveway so I could just back right out. Um, and so I get up one morning, and I'm a little bit groggy from uh, not sleeping very well, and I switch on the heater, put in a cassette tape. I, I rock those in high school. And, uh, and I put it in reverse, and as soon as I back it up in reverse, crash. And I'm like, what just happened? Unbeknownst to me, and I feel good that I used the word unbeknownst in a correct manner. <laughs> unbeknownst to me, my sister who had got home later than me the night before decided, I'm just going to park behind John and he doesn't know. And so she parks her Honda Civic right behind my car, my truck. I back up, crash into her Civic. Now I'm livid, right? Because it's her fault, right? So I go into her room, she's still sleeping. And I go, what are you doing? You parked behind my truck. Why did you park there instead? Never mind the fact that a general rule of thumb when you're driving is to look where you're going and to not run into park things. It was her fault. Somehow it's her fault. We love to divert blame and blame other people. Have you ever been like washing a dish or something in the kitchen? And you're hold, then, or then you're holding food and then you back up and then you run into someone and food spills everywhere. And then you go, what are you doing? Why were you standing right there? <laughs> totally. Sinners like me. That's not a mistake. That's sin, okay? You're the one who spilt, but it's their fault. We do this all the time with our own shortcomings. It's not my fault I got angry, yelled, cussed, lost my temper. They're the ones driving me crazy. Been there? It's not my fault that this relationship is over. They're the ones that won't apologize. They're the ones who haven't asked for forgiveness yet. It's not my fault that I'm looking for romance elsewhere. She's the one not being intimate with me. We use all kinds of justifications for our own selfishness. Some fraternity members put Limburger cheese very gently on their brother's mustache while he slept. He woke up an hour later and said, this room stinks. He walked in the hall, says, this room stinks. This hall stinks. Walks down to the living room. 
he declares to everybody loudly, this living room stinks, can't find the source of the smell, kicks down the front door, takes a big whiff outside and says, the whole world stinks. And the real problem was right under his nose the whole time. <laughs> That's us, right? That's us with our own sin. It's a slippery slope. When we fall away from God, it's, it's very often not a fall, it's a slide, right? Look at Lot. It'll be on the screens. Lot looked toward Sodom first. Then he pitched his tents near Sodom. In Genesis 14, we find that Lot is now living in Sodom. And in Genesis 19, he sat at the gate of Sodom, which meant he was a judge or a leader of the city. It started with looking toward Sodom. Then he was near it. Then he was in it. Then he was leading it. Has this been your experience in life as well sometimes? Do you see the downward spiral? If you want 2018 to be the year of blessing, get honest with God and get honest with yourself. Get honest with God, get honest with yourself. Abram ends up rescuing Lot from the destruction of Sodom. And uh, we pick up the story in Genesis 20 when Abram is 99 years old, okay? And God speaks to him again supernaturally. Surely now, being 99, Abraham won't make the same mistakes that he did in the past. Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. Now Abraham moved on from there in the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed at Gerar. And there Abraham said to his wife, uh, said of his wife, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech, Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Did Abraham just say to somebody else, that he, she's his sister. In le Abraham, Father Abe, come on, buddy. You, I, fool me once, shame on me, right? What is happening? He makes the same mistake twice. You ever been there? God, I'll never do this again. God, I learned my lesson. I am never gonna do that thing again. And what do we end up doing not long after? Lord, I hate this sin or I hate this struggle in my life. I'll never do it. That's Abraham. And he encountered God supernaturally in the chapters before. We think, oh, if I encountered God supernaturally, like if God spoke to me, if, if I said to this alarm clock, God, just lift the alarm clock real quick. Just move it up real quick. I know you're real. Supernatural encounter, and then I'll follow you forever. Abraham got that. He got these divine supernatural encounters, and he still goes back to the same mistakes that plagued him years before. Why do we go back to them? Why do we continue to do the things that hurt us? There's a pastor on the radio show, um, takes calls from different people. And the caller said, hey, excuse me, pastor, you, you don't know me, but I'm calling you to pray for something. I've asked my pastor, but he won't do it. Then he paused for a moment, rambled for a couple of minutes, and then he got to the point of his phone call. He says, I know that you, pastor, are a man of prayer. I've heard you talk about it on the radio. It seems like you really care for people. Will you help us? The pastor says, sure. What is it you want help with? He says, see, I know this is gonna sound bizarre. I know it's gonna sound bizarre, but uh, I'm in love with my best friend's wife and she's in love with me. And you gotta believe me that when I tell you that both of our hearts, like we know God wants us to be together. We, we know and we desperately want to be married to one another. Will you pray that God will give us to each other and that our church could accept us? And the rebuke was just coming right to the pastor's mind. He's getting ready to say it on air, a rebuke on this guy. But he just realized, man, if this guy's pastor couldn't talk any sense into him, what makes him think he can convince him over the radio? So the pastor didn't need to chastise him on the radio. He needed to pray for him on air. So the pastor prayed silently for a moment, asked the spirit, what do you want me to do? And the pastor said, sure, I'll be glad to pray for you. I just need your names. The man said, I'm Jean. She's Gloria. My best friend, his name is Mark. And he says, okay, Jean, let's pray. God, you know Jean's heart. You know his desire for Gloria. He says, they want to be married. 
they want him to take the place of her husband instead of Mark. And so God, I pray that you would kill Mark. And the guy says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And the pastor responds calmly. I'm asking to make it possible for you to be with Gloria as your wife. I'm doing just what you asked me to do. But Mark is my best friend. I don't want him dead. Don't you have any compassion? And he says, me, compassion? You are, want to le- sleep with your best friend's wife. Do you know what that would do to him? Do you know what that betrayal would cost him? Do you know the pain and heartache and brokenness that would cause for your best friends? If he's dead, he's in heaven. The pastor didn't have time to finish the conversation as the man hung up. See, we often want supernatural intervention for our temptations and some kind of justification. But God has already given us the capacity to play it forward. Play it forward. Is this decision going to lead to more love and goodness and mercy and compassion in my life? Or is it going to lead to hatred, discord, pain? Realize whatever the sin is, it's not going to work out in the end. Justifications don't work. It's our, it's our flesh that's trying to justify. That's what sin does. It disrupts our relationships. It brings pain, not love. Listen, you are not a prisoner of your sin. Jesus can free us. Leave it today. Jesus will free you. It won't be easy to let it go, but many of us have been in prisons for so long. Jesus can break those chains. How? Sunday school answer. Jesus. I want to invite Macy and the worship band up as I close with this. A man once bought one of Whistler's famous paintings that the great artist had made, and he had difficulty finding the right place to put it in his, phone, in his home. And the artist agreed to help. And so he brought Whistler himself to the home. And then he, they walked around, placing it in different places throughout the house, trying to figure out where's the right place for this masterpiece. Finally, Whistler said, you're going about it all wrong. What you need to do is move all the furniture out, hang the picture where you want it, and then arrange all the furniture in relationship to the picture. And this morning, the Spirit of God is giving us a similar message. He doesn't want to be added to your already busy life. He wants to be first. He wants you to let him come in and help you arrange everything else around him. That's how we overcome our sin, not by trying harder, not by saying I won't do it, but by being more filled with Jesus, allowing him to give us the strength, not relying on our own strength. You will never overcome your failures or shortcomings by trying harder but by rather centering yourself in Jesus. 2018, how are you going to live? There were three frogs on a log. One of them decided to jump. How many are left on the log? Have you decided to follow Jesus? Or will you make the leap to truly follow him in 2018? God, I pray in Jesus' name, that 2018 would be the year of blessing, the year of blessing others, the year of getting honest with ourselves, the year of not settling there. God, I pray for those who have settled there, and I pray for more, more of your blessings, more of your love, more of your mercy, more of your compassion. God, we pray that you bless their homes, bless their families as they give themselves away in sacrificial love to the world. They model what you did for us 2,000 years ago. God, we pray that 2018 would be the year that we stop doing that one thing. And even now, as as, as we pray, the Spirit of the living God is stirring up inside of us what that one thing might be, what God is calling us to give up. Call it a New Year's resolution. Call it whatever you want. It's the beginning of revival. It's the beginning of a new life in Jesus where I'm not placing him in a certain spot, but rather I'm placing myself in a certain spot in relation to him. He's the center. And so God, help us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand together as we sing this song, Oh, Come to the Altar. Now, we don't have an altar here. We don't have, we have a stage. We have a theater. But even symbolically, if you feel there's something the Lord is calling you to leave, feel free to come up. Feel free to stay where you are and just
kind of lay it before God. Cast your cares on him because he cares for us. Jesus, solidify that in our spirit right now, in our lives. Let 2018 be the year of blessing. In Jesus' name. Hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought away The precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your Mistakes. Come the day, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling.